Why a Fed pivot would be bad for stocks. Now, all eyes are on the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell. Will they continue to crush the economy and markets by raising rates and more monetary tightening, or will they finally pivot? And what does a pivot even mean, and do we even really want it? Now, I consider a Fed pivot to be when they change direction, switching from their current tightening program and back to an easing cycle. And while everybody that's watching the market seems to be wanting this to come sooner than later, I say that sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for because you just might get it, and sometimes you may not like what you get. So in this video, we're gonna look at why a Fed pivot could actually be bad for markets. We're gonna look at the historical evidence of what happens when the Fed changes directions and pivots. We're gonna look at the bigger picture of the companies that make up the markets and the economy that you know we're all working and living in, and we're gonna discuss how to read these cycles, what to watch for, and of course, how we should play this. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything you've learned is wrong. Almost everything they tell you is wrong. And look, if you've gotten this wrong in the past, you've been hit hard by these booms and bust cycles, don't worry, you're not alone. Most people have, and it's the Fed's fault. We blame them. They're the ones that create this, but I'm gonna show you what they're doing. I'm gonna teach you a three-part framework, and hopefully you can navigate this next cycle much better. All right, now, one thing about the markets is that there's a lot of other ways to build wealth in businesses and in markets, and there's an entire new market opening up. I call it the parallel economy. I'm gonna host a three-day event. I have Robert Kiyosaki coming to break down business investing in this new parallel economy. There's a link down below if you'd like to check it out. But let's go ahead and through the, go through this video so I can explain this next market cycle. And this is what I'm watching for in 2023 to let me know how to play this market, and hopefully it works for you as well. All right, the Fed pivot. <laughs> Everybody wants the Fed pivot, right? You're watching your retirement accounts draw down. Maybe depending on where you live, you're watching your house volume, uh, value draw down. Uh, obviously, layoffs everywhere. Amazon just laid off 17,000 people, and that's because the Fed has been tightening, right? So November 2021, they announced they're gonna start tightening. Everything started selling off. You know, the market's selling off. And so everybody wants them to pivot. Stop tightening. That's the pivot, right? Instead of tightening, go back into easing. Blow up the money supply, right? Now, again, we have to first blame the Fed. Put, put blame where blame is due, and it's all the Fed's fault. They're the ones that cause booms and busts. And I have the facts, the charts, and the data to back it up, the receipts as I like to call it. So right here, 1913 is the year the Federal Reserve was created, 1913. Now they tell you there's two mandates. One, stable prices. So not booms and busts, stable prices, to full employment. That's what they're supposed to do. They are supposed to even out the cycle so we don't have big booms and busts. So the theory behind the Federal Reserve is that there's natural market cycles, there's natural business cycles, Humans are irrational. I love, you know, uh, in the 80s, we loved Day Glow, and then in the 90s, it went out and it was grunge, for example, right? And so we change. I like vanilla ice cream, now I want chocolate ice cream. We change, and so, you know, people bought too much of one thing, they invested into something people didn't want, and so there's booms and busts. But the Fed is supposed to control the market to ease that. But what we can see in this chart, at 1913, when they started, this was the natural boom and bust cycle before Fed. Here's the boom and bust cycle after Fed. Now this is what we'd call a megaphone pattern, which means it's getting bigger. So looking at this, is the Fed doing a good job? And of course the answer is no. All they do is make every single boom and bust bigger, and they actually cause the booms and busts. So let's say 2020, they add in you know $5 trillion into the economy, everyone starts buying a bunch of things, Amazon can't keep up with it. So Amazon starts building new fulfillment centers, they hire all these people, and now the Fed sucks the money out, and now no one's buying anything, and now Amazon just laid off 17,000 workers. And so they cause the booms and busts. Now, you know, I feel bad for the people, you, you just got that good job at Amazon, you're super happy, um, you bought a new car, you let your wife quit her job, and now you're just laid off and now you're probably gonna go into financial ruin, maybe even bankruptcy. It's not your fault, it's the Federal Reserve's fault. All right, now we can see this chart right here, the blue line is the M2 money supply. So by lowering interest rates and by changing reserve requirements with the bank, they increase the money supply. And as we can see, the money supply is changing and we can see that the gold line is the S&P 500 index. And so as the money supply goes up, 
Guess what? Stocks go up too. Oh, surprise, surprise. Uh, as the blue line goes up, so the gold line goes up. The blue line goes down, the gold line goes down. You can see that. Now down here, the blue line, the money supply is going down because they're tightening the money supply. They're sucking it out of the system. And of course, we can see the S&P 500 going with it. Now this green line right here is charts courtesy of Luke Grauman, by the way. Shout out to Luke. Um, this green line is the projected extension of the uh, money supply decreasing. At the current pace they're at now, this is where it will go. What do you think is gonna happen to stocks? Well, <laughs> looking at the chart, you should be able to tell. All right, we can, but what I wanna also show you is the history of the Fed pivots. All right, so they cause these because they go into easing, they increase the money supply, and then they tighten and they suck it back out. And then they ease it and they increase it, and then they suck it back out. And they do it over and over and over. And we can see the majority of the decline in these bear markets occurred after the Fed pivot. So everyone, the markets are declining right now, and everyone's like, please, Fed, pivot, pivot, save my retirement. But what happens is historically, the markets crash after a Fed pivot. We can see this. 1969 Fed pivots, market goes down 30%, 36%. 73 Fed pivots, markets go down 48%. 1981 Fed pivots goes down by 27%. 2000 Fed pivots, market goes down by 51%. 2007, market goes down by 58%. 2019, market goes down by 35%. It's not a good track record. So, when I said, careful what you wish for, you might get it. You wish for the Fed pivot, but do you want the 58 or 51 or 35% drawdown that comes with it? And it gets worse than that. All right, let's break this down a little bit because there's unintended consequences in the greater market. I'm talking about the zombies. You might have heard this term before, the zombie companies, the zombie economy. There's thousands and thousands of zombie companies out there. And what the heck am I talking about? No, this isn't some horror movie and this is a bigger problem you have to be aware of. And so the zombies, uh, think of a zombie right in a movie, it's uh, the walking dead, right? Uh, they feed off of the flesh of productive people. And so think of companies, they're the same thing. A company is a dead man walking, right? It's, it's a dead company. It's not producing profit. And it's feeding off of the production of other companies. Just like we wouldn't want zombies walking around with us in, in public, we also don't want zombie companies. Now, a zombie company classified as they can't cover the interest on their debt. Pretty much every company, especially you know publicly traded companies, they all have debt. There's good debt and there's bad debt, and they have debt, but they can't cover the interest on the debt, so they're not earning enough money. Now, they, again, just like a real zombie, they stagger along, right, dead. They can't cover the interest debt, so their debt's just growing, and they're dragging the entire economy down with it, and in order for them to even stay alive, just like a zombie, they have to keep consuming, not flesh, but they have to keep cheap, uh, cheap credit in order to survive. All right. If they can't continue to get cheap credit, if they can't restructure their debt, then what happens? Then the zombie company dies, which is exactly what should be happening. Now, there's a, it depends on how you want to classify zombie companies, but again, they can't cover their interest on their debt. We can see that 5% of all companies across the globe are considered to be zombie companies. Um, the global debt carried by these companies equals uh, over $400 billion. So when these companies finally die, finally go bust, there's $400 billion that can just disappear right out of the ecosystem. And it's not just uh, publicly traded companies. A lot of it is in the real estate sector. One in seven, one in seven listed companies in the global real estate sector is at risk of being classified as a zombie. One in seven real estate companies, a zombie, about 500 billion. Now this is the word here misallocated by these zombies. And so that's what happens. And this is the problem with the zombies. You're giving uh, good money in bad. You're throwing away good money after bad, right? These are, these are bad companies. You're misallocating capital. As investors, we work hard for our money and we should put our money where it has a good return and misallocating is bad. It leaves them at a significant risk of default. Now, we can also see that uh, Again, looking at how these zombie companies work, in the era of speculative investing, and I'm gonna talk about these different stages so you can understand where we're at and how to invest in it, but we're in this era of speculative investing, and when we're in this speculative investing, meaning 
I'm not getting any return. So investing is typically I'm getting some return. Speculative is I put it there and I pray that hopefully one day I get a return. And in that era, we increase the number of zombie companies. But what it does is it hurts productivity. And that's the problem. What we're supposed to be doing is increasing productivity. That's what capitalism is about. We're increasing productivity. Instead of carrying one brick at a time, we make a wheelbarrow. Instead of digging a road by hand, we make a tractor and we increase human productivity. But this hurts productivity. It made the economy more vulnerable to recessions. And so that's part of the reason why you see these recessions getting worse and worse and worse. This makes it worse. Zombies have caused a meaningful reduction in growth. The GDP, the gross domestic product growth, has been declining because of the zombie companies reducing growth and prosperity. Zombie stock is a waste of capital. People are putting money into dead companies that are never going to grow. Um, losing the opportunity to invest that in more productive areas. So we could invest this money into productive areas that could have massive improvement for the economy and for humankind, but instead you're just shoveling into companies that are dead and will destroy the capital malinvestment. Deutsche Bank strategist Jim Reed said last year that zombie companies weaken economies by minimizing the growth of firms in the industries in which they operate. And so you have, well, we're gonna look at a couple of examples of that, but you have one company that's a dead company and people are invested into that instead of putting that money into good companies who are using that capital efficiently. Um, and it drags on the productivity and growth. And this is the problem that we keep coming back to. The survival of zombie companies is a threat to the entire U.S. economy. The fact that they're even living is a threat to the entire U.S. economy. Just like if zombies were walking around among us, they would be a threat to all the people alive, right? Uh, if we don't have efficient and productive capital markets, we lose probably one of the biggest competitive advantages that we have as a country as in, in the United States, which is our ability to allocate capital more efficiently. The reason why the United States financial markets are the biggest is because of our advantage, which is we can allocate capital efficiently. But if we lose that, um, if we can't allocate it efficiently and rapidly to its highest and best use, then it undermines the entire financial system. This is what the capital markets are about, allocating capital to its highest and best use. Of course it is. I say that money goes where it's treated best. That's been kind of the saying of my entire investing career. Money goes where it's treated best. That means where it's gonna be treated the best, protected the best, used the most efficiently, get the best returns, and it's certainly not zombie companies. Zombie companies, uh, here's a couple examples. Um, of course, you might know uh, Carvana is this one. It's Dead Man Walking, Fresh Pet, Peloton, um, things like that. AMC, GameStop, we'll talk about some of those. And then we have zombie companies investing into zombie companies. So here we have Bed Bath & Beyond. They've been a dead man walking for a long time. Everybody knows it. I don't even know what they're even still open for. Now they're saying that their shares are plummeting and they're finally gonna warn of potential bankruptcy. This was as of January 5th. Bed Bath & Beyond is running out of cash, of course, yeah, and they're considering bankruptcy, they should. They have trouble getting enough merchandise to even fill the shelves. And because they can't fill the shelves, they can't get customers to come in. See, that's a downward spiral. They can't get out of this. It anticipates a net loss of $385 million for just the third quarter. They're gonna lose almost $400 million in just a quarter. Like, how do you even lose $400 million in a quarter? They should shut down. Well, well, the other Ponzi company seems to like that, so no matter how bad Bed Bath & Beyond is, the other zombie company we have here, GameStop, um, the chairman, Ryan Cohen, reveals that he's investing $150 million into that company, into Bed Bath & Beyond. So GameStop, which is a zombie company, <laughs> is investing 150 million into another zombie company, just destroying capital. This is the worst case. This is what's called malinvestment. It destroys the entire economy and the entire financial system. Now, it also shows this end of the cycle, and I'm gonna show you the cycle so we can invest properly through it, is also, this part of the cycle is also dominated by what's called Ponzi finance. Kind of like a kind of basically like a zombie um, where unless there's money going in money doesn't come back out right they have to continue to get cheap capital ponzi finance one of the big examples is blackstone you probably heard about this they became the largest buyer of single family homes across the united states this is a private equity story lots of private equity is in the same boat as this uh, brought about by this final stage in the cycle of Ponzi finance. So Blackstone has this $68 billion uh, BREIT. They call it, it's like a REIT, but it's a BREIT. 
And it's basically like FTX and crypto and WeWork. It's all the same thing. It's all Ponzi, Ponzi finance. Uh, across the economy, a lot of ventures set up under a free money regime. So when BlackRock could get access to basically free money, then they go buy all the single family homes for 35% over value. Now it's not their money, it's free, so they don't value it. They don't allocate it efficiently or appropriately. And then they make a lot of malinvestment. So the free money regime in which insiders cash out while the bag holders are left with worthless magic beans. So in FTX, they, they uh, took money out. Sam Bankman Free took money out, bought us parents, a bunch of houses, all these things, took all the money and the people were left with magic beans or in that case, FTT tokens, Blackstone being the same thing. Private equity giant Blackstone has a $68 billion private real estate investment trust, private real estate investment trust or BREIT. Investors buy a pool of random assets. So you don't even know what you're buying. You're not buying a piece of real estate, an apartment building that you own. You're just buying random assets like shopping malls, housing, commercial real estate, basically the stuff you don't want to own at this very economic moment. That's the stuff you don't want to own, but you have no control over it. You just bought into a bunch of random stuff you don't even know. Now, the structure of that breed is controlled by the insiders, just like at FTX, Sam Bankman Fried and Caroline controlled it. And just like this, Blackstone also has control. The value of the breed doesn't go up and down with the stock market. So it's not mark to market. The value doesn't go up and down. Um, or uh, like similar assets, it's privately assessed. So Blackstone themselves and their accountants tell you what the value is, not the market. This gives the firm control over investor capital. So your money's locked up in there. They're buying a whole bunch of random stuff that you probably don't want to own right now. And the valuations don't even go up and down with the market because the insiders are controlling it. Then comes the skimming for the favor of buying into a bunch of garbage overvalued assets. Um, a set of deflating assets held in a very opaque entity. Blackstone takes about 3.6% in annual fees. That's their fee for uh, controlling your money. 3.6 or over $2 billion a year. The model is no different than the crypto um, craze. In this case, Blackstone cashes out on the insiders while the investors get hosed. So uh, very similar. And this is the final stage of the Ponzi finance. Now it's still going, but it's ending. Now we can see right here, just as of, um, just as of this week, University of California is going to invest 4 billion more in the Blackstone's breed. They just don't understand. They don't get it. And that they're still continuing to invest money. That's what we're talking about. Malinvestment. They're destroying pension money. All right, cool. We understand this. So now what, what are we going to do? How do we protect ourselves? How do we make money from this information? Well, we do this. Uh, we can understand something called the Minsky moment, which we're about to be into. Uh, Minsky um, kind of looked at markets and saw there was really three distinct phases and understanding the phases should dictate the way that we invest through these phases. All right. So there's three phases. The first one is what he calls the hedge phase. That means we're protecting what we have. We're very careful. The second one is the speculative phase. This is where money starts flying around into anything and everything where the bubble really starts to blow up. And then finally the Ponzi phase. So you can see this. So this blue line, this lower blue line is the GDP, the gross domestic product. And so after a bust, we're down here at the bottom and everybody's, everybody's scared. Everyone took a licking. You took big hits in your retirement portfolio. You're scared of putting money back out there. And so you're trying to protect it. You're hedging it. You're in this hedge finance. But what happens is as the market finally starts going up and home prices are going up and stocks are going up and you start to feel better, you finally get a little bit loose with your monetary policy. You're starting to put money out there and it starts driving it up. Next thing you know, you're buying spec real estate. You're buying companies like Uber that have never produced a profit. That's the speculative phase. And then it blows up the bubble even bigger and even faster but it allows the final stage, which is the Ponzi stage to get up. And these are the WeWorks. These are the FTXs. These are the Blackstones. And these are the Bed Bath and Beyonds, the zombie companies. They can't survive if it wasn't for cheap capital. But what happens is this Minsky moment, the Minsky moment. And so all of a sudden interest rates start to go up and liquidity dries up and zombies can't get access to cheap capital. They can't roll the debt over. And then what happens? Oh, the whole thing collapses. We can take a look at it here. It's kind of similar to the wall street um, psychology. And this is basically what we have here. The smart one, we have the takeoff. So the asset prices are just kind of get going. 
It's a little sell off. We call this a bear trap. It takes off. But here's where like the media is like, oh, this market's really moving. People start getting um, enthusiastic about it, right? Oh, I guess we can make money. We're getting back involved. And then the public starts hearing about it, right? The news is now talking about it. And so people are now starting to buy up everything. You get to this greed phase where everyone just wants to buy anything. Just put my money in. Everyone's getting rich but me, the FOMO. Then there's the delusional phase. Prices always go up, right? This time's different. Market cycles are broken. The Fed got the put. The Fed's gonna bail us out. That's the delusion, the new paradigm. The Fed's always got our back, don't they? The Fed's certainly gonna pivot if markets drop, right? They're gonna bail us out, right? That's the delusional. And then, boom, the denial, the return to normal, the fear, capitulation, and finally, despair. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm down so far. And then the cycle starts all over. So when you understand that, and he broke it down into these distinct phases. We'll go through this real quick. So the hedge phase, like I said, these are strict credit policies. Investors favor very low risk activities. We just got burned. We just lost a bunch of money. We're not going to go back in. Speculative borrowing. This is where credit loosens up. Borrowing rises, so people are taking on more and more money. And then it also causes asset prices to go up because people are buying it. And then we start getting good returns. The, the economy's healthy, right? We just cleansed, right? We just had the forest fire. Things are growing healthy again but then we get to the Ponzi phase. Now we have high debt, all these risk-taking activities, high valuation of assets, like over 20 times PE ratios on stocks, and then people start selling assets, and then finally the entire market collapses. Now, if you wanna understand how this works, we have this chart, but we can also look at this. Remember, all eyes are on the Fed. So this is the money supply, the M2 money supply. Now, as money supply goes up, asset prices go up as well. Then we have this right here. This is the 2020 where they blew it sky high and asset prices continued to go up until the end of 2021. And then what happened? They went into tightening and sucked the money out of the system. And look at what's going on with the money right here. And of course, now asset prices go down. So all we have to do is understand the cycles. We know we are at this Minsky moment where they blew us into Ponzi finance. We see it all over the place. You got GameStop buying Bed Bath & Beyond for crying out loud. And then here we have the money going out of the system. All right, so how do we ride the waves of this? And what are we gonna do now that we know this information and we're heading into 2023, all right? Well, uh, what we know right now is that the Fed is continuing on their tightening path. Now this pivot, this proverbial pivot is gonna come at some point, right? Right? Well. Let me tell you, the Fed doesn't care about your stocks. They don't care about your retirement account. They don't care about your home. They don't care if it drops 20% or 30% or 50% more. What they care about is liquidity in the system, but we have to keep an eye on that. We wanna know the transition cycles. Right now, we wanna keep a margin of safety. You don't always have to be buying something. Not buying something is doing something, staying in cash. So we wanna keep a healthy margin of safety in cash. We wanna resist taking on debt, specifically bad debt. That means debt that doesn't have a return. Like buying a rental property has money coming in, buying a piece of equipment that make you money, that's good debt. And then we wanna get ready to deploy savings into the panic. Well, how do we know when it's time to deploy the savings? Well, we wanna look at a couple things. So here is the Fed funds rate. So the Fed is tightening the cycle and they do that by rising, raising the price of money by raising interest rates. Now what we can see here, back to the, the proverbial pivot, when they pivot, when they started raising, uh, lowering rates here, this gray area is a recession. They started lowering rates here, and then we went into recession. They started lowering rates here, and then we went into a recession. You see how that works? So the pivot, they were raising, 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 raising. When they pivoted and went down, the recession. They were raising, 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 raising. When they went down, recession. See how that works? Now, here we are, the fastest, steepest raise that we've seen. When that proverbial pivot comes, what do you think comes next? You have history here. Now, we also wanna be watching the money supply. As we already looked at, the money supply increases, prices go up. Money supply decreases, prices come down. So watch the money supply. Watch the price of money, which then dictates the money supply. Now, we can see the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is the price of money. So we wanna watch this, wait for something like this at least, a somewhat of a pause, and then maybe we'll get this with a big crash. All right, so we need to watch the price of money, the Fed funds rate. We need to watch the money supply, and then we need to be ready to deploy the capital. We don't wanna get caught up in fear. 
We want to understand that when the market's bottom, that's the time of the cycle to get back in. So to recap, stay patient, stay safe. Doing nothing is doing something. Understand the cycles and get ready to deploy money in the fear and panic of the market. And again, what we're watching for is we're watching the money supply, really the price of money, which is the Fed funds rate, and the M2 money supply. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Leave me a comment, let me know. All right, now in 2023, there's an even bigger opportunity because there's an entire new economy being built, what I call the parallel economy. So if you're trying to build wealth in the old system, your money, your business, there's layoffs happening, trying to invest in old tools, it's not gonna work. The world's changed. We're going into a new paradigm. The parallel economy is here. It's the biggest opportunity we have. I have three days. I'm gonna break it down. I have some of the best speakers in the world. Robert Kiyosaki is gonna come talk about business and investing, some other big speakers. There's a link down below if you'd like to come check it out. Uh, we're gonna be doing it right here from this studio. and It's live, but you can tune in from wherever you're at. Check it out, there's a link down below. Otherwise, let me know about this video, what you think. Now that you understand the cycles, are you ready? Are you gonna sit there ready with your shopping list and take advantage of it when the panic sets into the market? Or are you just gonna buy now and buy at the top? Don't do that. Uh, let me know what you think down, low, down below. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up if you like this video. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down, that's okay. But at least tell me why if you give me a thumbs down. And that's what I got, to your success. I'm out.